Okay, well, this is the last class of the semester, and um, I would like to uh, kind of clarify that very confusing lecture that we had last time. As you know, I've sent you all emails about the corrections. The problem was the slides were wrong. The material, the, some material in the book that described this thing was wrong. <laughs> and so I've had to post erratas on the book and I was following, I was trying to follow what the slide said and it was all incorrect. So it was a bit of a comedy of errors last time. So I would like to kind of uh, get, get things straightened out here. Uh, spend a few minutes at the beginning straightening out this uh, material that we were, had started last time. And it's your last homework assignment. This is relevant to the last homework assignment that's due. Uh, tonight anyway, right? So here is the um, correct slide. Um, linked, the recipe for how to translate a linked data structure uh, with a local pointer. So first you equate the pointer field to its offset from the first byte of the node. Now, because you see in an array, the offset from the first byte of the array is stored in the index register, right? So that's the offset. So with a record, with a struct, what happens is the offset, the thing that corresponds to the index is the name of the field. So that because the name of the field is the offset, the value of the name of the field is the offset from the first byte. It corresponds to what the index is in an array. And so that's why the field is, is always put into the index register using immediate addressing because it, it, because it equates to the offset. So that corresponds to the index of an array. So that's, that's the idea. And then you allocate storage for the node with um, the total number of bytes in the accumulator, use, calling malloc, and then, uh, and then here is a, also a corrected slide. Um, that is the recipe for how to actually access the field pointed to by P. Okay, and the way, so the recipe is that you, again, you put the field pointed to by P in the index register with load word index register with immediate addressing because that corresponds to the index of an array. It's the offset from the first byte of the array, of the structure in this case, instead of the array. And now, in or, if you want to get the field from, if you want to get the field from the structure, in, then you, you, you would use a load word. If you want to change the field of the structure, you would use store word instead, right? So one is, it depends on if it's on the left-hand side or the right-hand side of the assignment statement. If it's on the right-hand side of the assignment statement, you want to get it with load. But if it's on the left-hand side of the assignment, you want to change it. So then it would be a store. So these, this load word accumulator and load, or load byte accumulator would be store word accumulator or store byte accumulator in case you wanted to change the value of the field. Are you with me? So what you do then is you, you do load word accumulator or load byte accumulator uh, from P using stack relative index addressing. And what I would like to do in a minute is show you an actual address computation about how that works. All right, so anyway, this is the recipe. And here in figure 6.48 is the program that we were generating code for the last time. And so I don't want to, uh, you know, take the time to go through and repeat it all. So we'll just take a look at the figure. So but can we tell here on figure 6.48 struct node int data and then struct node star next. So my question is, and we did this last time, what does data equate to? You remember? What would data equate to? What's the offset from the first byte? Is data the first byte? So what does data equate to? Zero. And then what does next equate to? Two, because that's two bytes down in the structure. Are you with me? So we did that last time. And then in the main program, we have, we have three variables. We have first, P, and value. So it would be first would be down here, and then P would be here, and then value would be here, right? Uh, yeah, here's the picture on figure 6.49b. So you see 
Oh, good. <laughs> yes, in figure 6.49b, it's first is, on, is below, and then P, and then ba value. And so now you can tell from that figure, now what does value equate to? Zero. Zero. And P equates to? Two. And first equates to four, because they're on the runtime stack on the main, in the main program, right? Is everybody clear on how that is? So that's just like we did usual local, local variables, right? And now... And now what I would like to do is show you the address computation of, of, of stack deferred indexed. Now, this uh, picture in figure 6.49 is a, is a little snapshot. And if we go back to the program in figure 6.48 in the listing, you see here on line 0030, what we are translating is Oh, with this, the C statement that's being translated is first arrow next gets P, All right? So that's the, that's, what, that's the statement that's being translated. First arrow next gets P. And so how do, you, how do we translate first arrow next gets P? It's load word accumulator P. So that's, putting, that's the right-hand side of the assignment statement. So that's being put into the accumulator. Now, how do you put it into the struct? How do you put it into the structure, into first arrow next? So you load word index register next, immediate addressing. That's on line 0033. Do you see that? And then store word accum accumulator first using SFX, stack deferred indexed addressing. Now what I have here, what I've drawn here on the board is a picture of that, that's the same picture from the text, figure 6.49. At this point, this is the high-level language part of the picture. And that um, statement that we that, uh, just got was getting translated. Let's go back to the listing. It's first arrow next gets P. And this is a snapshot of what happens just before this executes. So you know and see what does... Because this is a pointer assignment, what does this make? This makes what? First arrow next do what? Point to the what? The same thing that, P, not to P, but to the same thing that P points to. Are you with me? And that's the way pointers work, right? So what this does, basically what this does is that, 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 that statement is setting this link right here. Because P points to this node 20, and first points to this structure, and first arrow next is this pointer, so that makes this pointer point to the same thing that P is pointing to. Are you with me? So that's, we know that from our pointers in C or C++, right? So this is a typical linked data structure, all right? Assign, a pointer assignment to link up, to link, to link this node to this one. The translation for this was, now let's translate this again. So what, can we, can we, without looking at the code, can we reproduce this? So what did we do here? Load word accumulator, P addressing mode. Now P is a local variable. So what? S, S because it's, it's a local variable on the runtime stack. And now how, do we get, now, how do we get first arrow next to point to that? Next is the offset, right? So, so we do what? Load word index register. Next, addressing mode? Immediate. Because it equates to the offset, right? And then how do we store that? In, and then how do we, now how do we put the value of P in here. So this will be pointing to the same thing as this. So this, that would be what? And now is this going to be a load or a store? It's going to be a store because it's in the accumulator and we're putting it in here. So this is going to be a store what? Store word accumulator what? First, comma what? SFX. Is everybody good with this? Everybody see? So that's how we do this translation. But now look, you guys, let's do this in a little bit more detail. So look, so what is the operand? It's mem, do you remember what S operand for SFX? 
Do you remember what it is? I mean, you'll have this on your chart, you know, on the, on the exam. You'll, you'll have all these addressing modes. But do you remember what it is? It's mem sub what? Mem sub what? I think it's, it's stack deferred, so it's what? It's SP plus what? Operand specifier. And then this, and then what? Plus X, and then mem of that. Okay, so if you look that up on the chart, that's what it is. That's SFX. So now here, you guys, let's go back to, let's go here in figure 6.49, and let's see if we can identify what the value of, what the value of P is. What is the value of P? What, what's in the cell for P? What's the value of P? Yeah, in, in figure 6.49B, what's the value of P? 007A. All right, so that's... 0078. Now, why is that 007A? Because P, you see on, in figure 6.49A, what is P pointing to? The cell that has what? 20 in it. Well, what is 007A? Where is that 007A? Do you see up there in the heap? That's the first byte of the cell that has 20 in it. So P is, 00, P is 007A. And now what is, so we, we need P. Now, what about SP? What is SP? What's the value of SP? FB89. You see, because that, that's that little pointer. So it's FB89. Is everybody clear on that? And our here, the, the instruction that we are the instruction that we are translating now, the instruction that we're that we are translating is store word accumulator first SFX. So tell me. What is the operand specifier of this instruction? First. So let's go look at the figure. What is the value of first? 007E. Now do you see why it is 007E? So here, first is 007E. Now why is that 007E? Let's come over here again. See? First is 0070. Well, what is at 0070? Where is 0070? That's what? That's this part from the heap, this cell from the heap, 007E, right? And that is the, and what is that zero? That's the first byte of the node that has what in it? 30 in it. So you see, this first is pointing to the cell with 30 in it. Yes. The, okay, first, so the question is, why does first equal 0078, why doesn't it equal 4? Because, for the, oh, I see. Yeah. When I said, oh, you're right. First is 4, mem sub first is 0078. Uh, you are right. Uh, what, I was, what I was putting here was what is in the cell that P points to. Right. So P actually is, P is 2. You're right. Yeah. So P does have the P the value of P is two because it is the offset. Actually not to be consistent. But now it, but that's consistent with this, right? Because SP really is FB89. Because that's the content of the stack pointer. And what about first? The value of first is actually four. The what it was pointing to I was saying what it was pointing to, but anyway, the value of first is four. But so now look. So here, so here, so let's let's work this out. It's mem. It's mem sub mem sub sp plus operand specifier plus x, and it's the mem of that. So now what, so now whenever we do this, whenever we do this computation, whenever we do this computation, uh, store word accumulator first, SFX, what, how, how, where do we store word accumulator? So let's take a look. So this is going to be what? Mem, sub mem, and now what did we say the stack pointer was? 
FB89 plus, and now what is the operand specifier? So the operand specifier is first, but what's the value of first? Four plus the content of the index register. But what did we put in the index register? Here, what, here, what did we put in the index register? We, we said load word index register what? Next, immediate. So the, what, what's the value of next? Two. Does everybody see that? Okay, so this is plus two. So now this is what? This is mem, sub mem. Now what is FB89 plus four? FB89, A, B, C, D. FB8D is correct. So this is FB8D plus two. Now let's look on our figure. What, so why are we doing FB8D? What, where it, what, what is FB8D in figure 6.49b? That's the what? That's the address of where what? FBAD is the address of where first is, right? Are you with me? So what is at mem FB8D? What is, where, what is at mem FB8D? 007E. Yeah. Zero Z, so this is mem 007E plus what? Plus 2. Now what's the significance of this 007E? What is at 007E? 007E, that's the what? The address of that first byte in the, in, the, in the structure that has 30 in it. All right? But we want the what? We want the next part of that. So what do we do? We add what? 2, which is the next part of it to get the offset. So then what is 007E plus 2? 0, 0, uh, 7E, F, 8, 0, is that right? So this would be 0, 0, 8, 0. But what's that 0, 0, 8, 0? What's that 0, 0, 8, 0? Yeah, well, that, yeah, that is here, going back to, that is this, all right? So, so, so that's, so that gets the, the, what P is, so that makes this point to the same thing P is pointing to. So do you see here that, do you see here that this two hanging out here is the offset in the structure, and this part of it is how we get to the local pointer on the runtime stack. Is everybody clear on that? Yeah, question? The null pointer is that? That's a really good question. And in C, the null pointer is zero. Yes. Yeah. And all of these, uh, null, you know, I think there's a null pointer, there's nil, uh, there's different ways to say it. But in the original C language and still to this day, the null pointer is literally the integer zero. Yeah. That's a very, that's a low level fact of life in pointer programming with pointers at, in, at, at the C level. You know, it's uh, considered good software engineering practice to, to use the identifier instead of to use zero, but that's basically what it is. I just did that to keep things simple. Yeah, so that's this symbol. This little ground symbol is like the, the sentinel for the, a, a linked structure, and it's, it's literally the integer zero. A yeah, good point. Now, I want to show you there's really slick there's a really slick demo of, um, of figure 6.48. I don't know if figure 6.48, I don't know if you've done this, tried this or not, but let's check this out. Okay, so here's our demo. Let's go to figure 6.48. And here's the uh, program. And we will do a build here. And um, start debugging. Okay, and so here we are. We're going to branch to main. 
so we're branching to Maine. And uh, notice that our struct field here, data is 0 and next is 2. And then we branch to Maine, and here are our local variables first, p and value, which are 4, 2, and 0, equate to 4, 2, and 0. And now when we sub sp, boom, here comes first p and value on the runtime stack. And now we'll single step through a, a couple of these um, to try to get to where the figure is. So here's the uh, load word accumulator, store word accumulator that makes first 0. And then we decimal input into, into um, value, and so that'll take this 10 and that'll put that in value, so value should turn to 10, and it does. And now we're going to do the while, so we'll do while, and we'll compare accumulator, and we won't branch, so now we're going to be in the program. So now here is first, this is P gets first. So first is 0 and P is 0, so it's not going to change, so anyway, P is 0 here. And now this is allocating from the runtime, uh, sorry, not from the runtime stack, this is allocating from the heap. So we're going to do load word accumulator 4, now why 4? What is for? Why are we doing? We're about to call. See, look here. We're about to call malloc. Why do we put the four in the accumulator? Yes, that's the number of bytes in the structure in the struct. So we put four in there, and we call. It, and now look, we called malloc, and so here's the heap. So there's next, and there's data. It allocated four bytes, and the trace tags told us how to label that. And then we go through the heap. And we return. And now that we return back to the main program, it was what? It was first gets. Um, it was first gets this, right? So now, so now, what is, now what will first be? Can you predict what first will be? When we click this button, what will first be? Any any takers? Yes, excellent. Zero zero seven six because this first now is pointing to this. Yeah. Okay. And now we'll and now we'll do uh, now now we'll do load load word accumulator data immediate so now uh, so data now what will data be any any what will the accumulator be when we click this uh, data yeah the, the data data is and it's immediate and the offset is zero so you're right so that so oh and the industry yeah it was load. Oh, it was load word index register, right? So, so zero. So I said I said the accumulator is the index register, okay? And then store word accumulator in the first. So there, so there is. Oh, and by the way, this is S F X, right? So you see, it's going, it's going into here, and then, etc. And then we'll go back in and we'll allocate from the heap again. And so there's. And notice that the drawing, it's it's in order. So we move the the one that just got allocated is on the bottom. And then, we're, and then we will go through and link this in. I, now let's get the 30. And so now here is the third one, and we're in malloc, and we will return to the program. And now um, first, we're going to store it into first. So now, now what will first be? Store word accumulator in the first, in the first store, sorry, store word index register, wait, store, store word index in the first. So what's in the index, what's in the index register now? 7E, so what will first have? So what will first have after this? 007E, so there it is, 007E. So now look, you see this is pointing to this. P is pointing to what? What's the value of P? Well, sorry, what is MIMS of P? Is 007A. So 7A, that's this one, you see? And now I think we are at the point where, the, where we did our, where, where we did this snapshot on the board. You see? Does everybody see how that works? And so here what we're, so here what, what we're doing is we're going to load word accumulator value S. So now the accumulator will, will get what? The accumulator gets the 30, okay? Actually, this is not. This is doing the value. This is not the one that we did on the board. But when we did, we did, the one we did on the board was first arrow next gets p. But anyway, this this is how th we, we get the value into thirty. So so um, thirty goes into the accumulator, and then data 
uh, load word index register data immediate. So index register has 0, 0, 0, 0 because the offset data is 0. And then store word, now so what will happen with this? So there's the 30. And now we get to the one that we just did on the board. Load word accumulator um, P using stack relative addressing. So now the accumulator has the 007A. And then put next into the index register. And then store word and boom. Now this one, now this one is pointing to this one. The 007A is pointing to this. And then this one points to this, and this one points to nil. Yeah? So anyway, I thought that would be, that's, um, and then we can finish it all out. And then this prints them out in reverse order. Okay, well, I wanted to take the time, uh, you know, to, to get this cleared up. And so we can spend the rest of the time talking about what's going to be on the final. So are there, let me just give you, I've, I, actually, I actually have said this before, but let's just repeat it. Um, so the thing about the final exam is that it will be, there will be no code, no Java code from your project. So that all is just extra stuff that we did as sort of a side, you know, well not side, it was a big part of the course, but it was, to, it was implementing all the theory that we learned about uh, principles of program translation, right? But so it will, it, the exam is going to emphasize chapter six, okay? So all of these examples that we have done, you need to know how to translate them. The bulk of the final exam will be how to translate from a C program at level HOL6 to um, assembly language, PEP9 assembly language, like what we just did. Okay, so I recommend that you know how to do those translations. That's how to translate between those levels. That's kind of like the key, understanding what goes on under the hood with a, a level six program. That's kind of like the key, chapter six is the key, is the key material that you need to, that most of the questions will be on. Now, in addition to that, there will be um, review questions to make sure that you understand how to do um, things in the previous chapter. For example, there will be, there will definitely be some translations from level assembly language five to um, ISA three, right? So know how to do you know how to do if you're given an assembly language program with symbols in it, how to actually translate those to binary to hexadecimal. All right, how to you know what the symbol table would look like? We've done I think I think both exams previously we had translations like that, and so there will again that will that will be there that will okay. That those kinds of questions will be there. And even as far back as chapter three on information representation, you need to know your binary. So you need to know like for a given cell, I, I don't know, like seven bit cell or six bit cell or whatever, you need to know how to represent unsigned and signed integers. You need to know what the range is. You need to know how to add and which status bits get set. You know, you need to know what ASL and ASR, all that stuff, all that's just very, very basic stuff. You need to know how masks work, bitwise and, bitwise or, you know, all, you, 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 need, you, need, to be, you need to be able to know how to do that. And then um, translation principles, you know, like, um, now here again, no code. I won't ask you like, uh, I won't ask you the difference between uh, table. I won't ask you to implement a finite state machine using table lookup versus, you know, uh, direct code technique. So implementation details and programming, programming with implementation details that won't don't that won't be on there. Okay, but on the other hand, finite state machines will you know are important to know. You know the the exercises that we did with finite state machines. Grammars, yeah, that's part of translation. Yeah, that could be in the review part, mm -hmm. in the cumulative part. Uh, okay, so here, let's do a little review. What are the four parts of a grammar? 
yeah, a, a, a set of, of non-terminals, a set of terminals, rules of production, and the start symbol, which is a what? A non-terminal. And what is a, tell me, give me the definition of a context-free grammar. What are the rules, what, how do you, how do you know if a grammar is context-free? If there's only one non-terminal non where? On the, left side. On the left side of a production arrow. If every rule of production only has one non-terminal on the left side of it. Yeah. Then it doesn't, then you can make that substitution regardless of the context. Otherwise, you know, you, there's context on the left side of that arrow, and you can only make that tr substitution based on the context. Yeah. And tell me, what, which two are equivalent? You have, we have three ways to specify a language. We have, we have uh, finite state machines, we have grammars, and we have uh, regular expressions. Which two are equivalent? Finite state machines and regular expressions. Finite state machines and regular expressions. And are they more powerful or less powerful than grammars? Less powerful. Less powerful. And here's a question from the, uh, yeah, here's a question. What about, is the, is the grammar of C context sensitive or context free? Is the grammar, in other words, in the grammar, is there only one non-terminal on the left side of a production arrow? Context -free. It's context free. But we know that the language itself is what? Context sensitive. Context -sensitive. Because you, yeah. Because, for example, you have to have the same number of actual parameters has to be the same number as the formal parameters. So you can't just, you know, so th that context sensitivity has to be added on in the, to the compiler and is not part of the grammar. Yeah, I, so I don't have any more material. You, can, you can ask away. Is there going to be? Nothing, no Java code. Okay. Nothing from the project. I will not ask you to implement. I will not ask you to do a table uh, a table lookup implementation. I won't ask you to do a direct code implementation. I won't ask you any coding. Well, assembler coding and translating, <laughs> you know, but no Java coding. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that, I, that's a favorite question of mine. <laughs> Let's review that. Uh, and I'm not guaranteeing anything, you understand. <laughs> there are no guarantees. But you know, you, we, have, we have this general setup. What do, all com what do all computation systems do? They have what? They have input, they do what? Processing. And then they produce what? Output. That's what they all do. Even if they are, even if it's the microwave in, in your, uh, even if it's the CPU inside your microwave oven, the output is the, are the electrical signals that turn it on and off and, you know, set this power setting and stuff like that. So are they, every, this, this, they all do this. And what is the, the principle, are, what is the guiding principle for, for how to figure out, for how to figure this stuff out? What must be here at all, with all runs? Machine language written in what? Binary. This must be binary machine language. Because what does the von Neumann cycle do? It does what? Fetch. Yeah, now when it fetches, it fetches an instruction. And when it does decode, how does it do the decode? What, what is it decoding? Yeah, the what part of the instruction? The instruction specifier and what part and yeah in the instructions and and then the first part of the instruction specifier is the what is the opcode and that opcode is what ones and zeros that's binary right that opcode is binary so when it so this, the only way that the CPU can process anything is if it's in, if if those bits those binary bits are in there. Right? You can't put an assembly language, you can't run an assembly, you can't run an assembly language program in here. In order to run an assembly language, in order to execute an assembly language program, what do you have to do? Convert it to binary, and then the binary goes in here. That, that, that's a huge idea in computer systems.
So yeah, that's, that's an important concept. Oh, drawing the runtime stack. You absolutely, you know, we started off in chapter two with exercises about how to draw the runtime stack. And when you translate a function call, you've got to be able to draw the runtime stack. So I might even ask you if, you, I mean, you need to do that every time you do a translation of a function call, but I might even be explicit and say, draw the runtime stack, maybe. I mean, you should, I mean, you should just as a matter of course, just do that all the time, yeah. What about the, uh... And what about, and here, actually here, let's review something else. And so what does happen when you call a non-void function? Now, do we know this yet? <laughs> we started memorizing this the first two weeks of class. Do we know this yet? What, what, get, go, what, what happens when you call a non-void function? Storage. storage for the what? Return value. And who does that, the caller or the callee? The caller or the callee? The caller. The caller. Okay. Okay. And what's the second one? Push the actual parameters. And who does that? The caller or the callee? The caller by doing sub SP. And then what's the third one? Okay. <laughs> Push the return address. And who does that? The caller or the callee? The caller or the callee? The caller. the caller. And what instruction does that? Call. <laughs> so the caller does call. <laughs> and that pushes the, re the return address. on the re And then what's the next one? Storage for the local variable. And who does that? The caller or the callee? The callee. By doing what? Sub SP. Yeah. Okay. So now what happens? The opposite. When you return from a function, <laughs> what do you do? Who does what? First, the what? The callee, wait, the callee does what? Pops the what? The local variables. And then, what about the return address? The caller or the callee? <laughs> yeah, actually, how does that, how, what instruction actually gets that, pops that? It's ret. Who executes ret? The caller or the callee? The callee executes ret. And that's what pops the return address. I think, we're, I think we're finally getting it, actually. Okay? And then what happens? The caller pops what? The actual parameters and the ret value. Actually, all at once. It does it because it does add SP. And then if it, if it's, if it is this, a non-void function, then it accesses the value returned. It's usually, it's usually minus two. I mean, it's usually a two-byte integer. And so it accesses it by doing uh, stack relative addressing with negative two. That's how it accesses that value that was returned. So, can you tr you, so you think you can translate little parts of a function call that does all that stuff? That's going to be a large part of the... Now, that was a good review because that's... that's the principle behind what, ha what goes on. Yeah. You know what? Yeah, the bandwidth equation and the, the pixel, so, you know, let's, yeah, you want, do you want, shall we exclude that? Okay. <laughs> I mean, that's good stuff to know, but yeah. We, yeah, we actually, we, we talk about that a lot in computer organization. So you should take that course. That's a good one, too. Yeah. That's what this is. That's what this is. I'm not guaranteeing. I'm, I'm not saying, you know. But it's a possibility. Well, this is kind of sad. This is our last day. We had a little alum come visit us here just before the lecture started. That was fun. But any more questions? All right, well, oh, and by the way, when is our final? Wednesday at 1.30. Wednesday at 1.30, okay. All right, well, good deal. I'll see you then.